Hello and welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm your host, Richard Reinch. Liberty Law Talk is featured at the online journal Law and Liberty, which is available at lawliberty.org. Hello, welcome to Liberty Law Talk. Today we're talking with Dan Mahoney, one of the principal founders of Liberty and Justice for All, a new uh, statement and declaration of the right kind of unity about American citizenship and education and constitutionalism. And we're going to let Dan tell us more about that. Dan is a frequent guest of Liberty Law Talk, and uh, we're glad to have him on. He's the Augustan Chair of Distinguished Scholarship at Assumption College. He's the author of a number of books, including The Idol of Our Age, How the Religion of Humanity Subverts Christianity. He's also uh, the author of The Conservative Foundations of the Liberal Order and the Other Solzhenitsyn. Dan, glad to have you on. Delighted to be back, Richard. So last time we were talking about uh, Chaz, which then became a CHOP, Capitol Hill, organized protest in Seattle. And we were, you know, how we were sort of discussing how the city government of Seattle could allow, you know, in effect, 10 blocks or so of its city to be taken over by Antifa, various thugs, left-wing protesters, who we now know worked a great deal of damage. Uh, and, and so we know this was sort of a microcosm effort of a lot of problems and unrest and unsettlement uh, in our country. And, uh, and we talked a lot of it about that. You've now become a part of an effort, which I've signed, called Liberty and Justice for All. Maybe tell us about that. Yes, we published a open letter with 173 signatories. The founders of the effort were myself, Mark Mitchell at Patrick Henry College, Jeremy Beer, publisher of the American Conservative, and Joshua Mitchell, the Tocqueville Scholar at Georgetown, who has a great book coming out from Encounter this fall called American Awakening, which is actually about the, the sort of tyranny of woke despotism. We all consulted, after I had published my essay on the culture of hate at uh, the Real Clear Politics around the 4th of July, my uh, colleagues contacted me and said, you know, we, we need a concerted effort to speak up in defense of American principles and institutions and against this nihilistic violence and mayhem. We were all, I think, stunned by the fact that this open assault on our history, on our institutions, on the symbols of the American Republic, on our Western inheritance, was being met by so little resistance. The Republican Party was acting as if this was uh, just business as usual. You know, this too shall pass. Trump was really the only one speaking up, most notably in his very powerful Mount Rushmore address, which was uniformly attacked by mass media. So we put our efforts together and we decided our best approach was to write an open letter to our fellow Americans, laying out in bold, but spirited, but nonetheless thoughtful ways, exactly what is at stake if those who are committed to the destruction of the American heritage win. And that's what we did. We laid out the fact that this movement is destructive and not constructive, that it's not dedicated to reformation, which depends on conservation, but is instead dedicated to a full-scale assault on America. We also, I think, were particularly concerned by the way in which admirable aspirations and principles were being used at the service of nihilism and destruction, especially a facile and ideological appeals to justice and equality. And I should add, we were deeply concerned by the iconoclasm, the tearing down of statues, the um, efforts mm-hmm. to cancel Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and Universera, the great saint in California, the ignorance of the mob as they tore down abolitionists and anti-slavery people. And we were, I think, uh, deeply concerned about his raison d'etre, the betrayal of the intellectuals who were either at worst endorsing and vigorously endorsing this madness and nihilism, and at best 
simply excusing it. So that was the genesis of our effort. Okay. As I said, we had 173 signatories, many very distinguished people, including yourself, from a wide range of backgrounds, uh, many conservatives, some liberals, many among what I call the unclassifiable, people who are not e- easily ideologically classified. And since the publication of the letter at Real Clear Politics about 10 or 11 days ago, we've had a thousand people sign on and about another thousand who can't sign for one reason or another, given the power uh, and intimidation of the cancel culture, but who want to be on our mailing list and implicitly, I think, endorse our aims. So we want this to be an ongoing effort. We followed up with a series of op-eds by Joshua Mitchell myself, Mark Mitchell, you, in a few days. Coming, yeah. Roger Kimball, you have a piece on the nature of woke despotism. Roger Kimball has a uh, piece on the subversion of American education. So we want this to be an ongoing effort, as you said, in defense of, of constitutionalism, of the rule of law, and of the fundamental nobility of the principles that underlie the American proposition. Where where can people are listening right now? Where can they find this this statement and sign up and and make their yeah make their yeah own? just do a, you can sign up and don't be concerned if your signature doesn't show up right away. We have to verify to make sure there's not spam and that kind of thing. You know, people okay. can write anything down, so it's not an automatic process. But if you sign it and you're committed to it, your name will appear once everything is verified. Uh, you can go to the Real Clear Foundation, do a Google search, Liberty yeah. and Justice, open letter, Liberty and Justice for All. Uh, you could also do the same thing for National Review, which ran the open letter the same day. And I believe the open letter just went out for, uh, for free subscription from Real Clear. And so okay. I think a group of sites are likely to run it with attribution. But I think a simple Google search open letter, liberty and justice for all, either Real Clear National Review, and you'll get to it in 10 seconds. Realclearfoundation.org, I think is the website. That's that's certainly where okay. I found it. So uh, thinking about future goals, building something of a movement, what are future plans, things you want to do? Well, right now we're concentrating on the series of op-eds that develop and clarify and move forward the ideas and inspiration of the letter. Uh, I think that will continue for a while. We also envision putting together a series of conversations, perhaps with the signatories of other letters that uh, take a different tack, opposing the cancel culture and the new liberalism. But uh, I think I, I know of one such effort that, that concentrates on higher education. Of course, there's the Harper's letter. I'm not sure if their signatories will want to talk to us, but we want to talk to them. We have one common signatory, uh, the admirable independent black linguist and intellectual John McWhorter. Okay. Um, I should add, we've also partnered. This was, this letter was co-sponsored by 1776 Unite. Okay. One of our organizers and initiators, Joshua Mitchell, is on the board of 1776 Unites. He's very close to Robert Woodson. 1776 Unites is a group of mainly African-American intellectuals. Robert's a bit of a community organizer in the best sense of the term, but who are committed to American principles, to the constructive and salutary and truthful role of religion, and to the hope inherent in the black experience and in the American Republic, the American Proposition, a wonderful group of people, John McWhorter, Wilfred Riley, Carol Swain, uh, John Wood, people around Robert, who uh, really challenge this narrative that American principles offer nothing for black men and women, or that Lincoln is this dreaded racist who needs to be canceled, or that there is no hope and that blacks are simply victims without agency and that the majority population in this country are simply white supremacists and oppressors who are beyond redemption. So I think that a prominent group of very gifted and serious African-American intellectuals are working to unite the American people 
to see how the principles of 76 should bring all of us together, should be a source of constructive engagement, uh, moving toward a more dignified future while building on what's noble in our principles and in our past, while being fully cognizant of the injustices that have marred the American experience. So that collaboration with uh, 1776 Unites is very important to us. I believe our letter is also available on the 1776 uh, Unites website. You mentioned in the letter the signatories concerns about free speech being eliminated largely through cancel culture. Uh, It occurs to me the First Amendment could be nullified without it being repealed if cancel culture continues because of just the self-censorship that will occur. Uh, Representative government, you mentioned that being sort of what undermined has debate becomes difficult uh, and has sort of these uh, very drastic measures are constantly asserted to be the only way certain institutions like city councils can deal with difficult issues like police reform, as in uh, defund the police. Uh, And then also you mentioned federalism, market commerce, education, family, and religion. I I wanted to talk briefly on market commerce just because of the centrality that that's played, as you know, in conservative thought throughout or or, since the post-World War II period and then the incredible weight it had after the Cold War. You, You mentioned two problems in this which will be well known to our listeners. The, the threat of crony capitalism, uh, where those who are entrenched in power can use that power to make more money for themselves and but foreclose opportunities to others. But you also mentioned woke capitalism. And I, I thought that was apt and correct. But we've got these two problems here, woke capitalism and crony capitalism. What does the, that mean or, or how should conservatives think about the market in in light of the challenge whereby corporations whom we've always you know largely been friendly towards now seem to be actively working against not only conservatism and the causes that they support but even perhaps the country itself you know eating away at their own foundations it seems to me yeah i'm a great admirer as i think you are of the writings of irving crystal and to a lesser extent, but genuinely Wilhelm Rupke. And uh, there's this kind of conservative liberal defense of the market that both men articulated uh, in the 40s and 50s for Rupke, for 60s, 70s, and 80s with Crystal, really made the point that the market economy is not self-subsisting. It depends upon the bourgeois virtues. It needs to be instantiated in a political order, the political order, which is a commercial republic. It depends on virtues that it sometimes undermines. So this is why Crystal famously in his 1978 book called for two cheers for capitalism. Not because he thought the market mechanism was inefficacious or should be replaced, but because market efficiency, when liberated from the larger republican order that grounds it and forms it, can be self-destructive. And I think we see that with both crony capitalism, which is really, you know, something in a, in a different language and somewhat different form, something that Adam Smith warned against in The Wealth of Nations, you know, mm-hmm. that he was never yes. so nervous that when merchants were conspiring against the public good, yeah. you know. And woke capitalism, I think, is a phenomenon that is tied to the... Uh, Corporate capitalism, as Irving Crystal pointed out, has always been a problem. It's not that it doesn't serve productivity and economic efficiency. And I, I think you're right. I think classical liberals and Ameri- conservatives in America have defended the corporation against demagogic criticisms, and we were right to do so. But on the other hand, when corporate capitalism simply ignores all the other goods that inform patriotism, the family tradition that inform a sturdy and serious uh, liberal Republican order. When corporate capitalists try to buy off socialist and uh, collectivist demagogues who are also pro- promoting uh, the sort of moral dissolution of civil society, I think these people have to be actively opposed. And this is an old phenomenon. Many uh, an anti-totalitarian has quoted Lenin's famous line about the capitalists giving us 
the rope to hang them with. There's a long line of uh, you know, this history is written of this of how Wall Street and corporate capitalists appeased or tried to do business with the, the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany and this kind of thing. I think we see it today with the People's Republic of China. We see it with the NBA in China. So our manifesto, our open letter is unequivocally in favor of the principles of the commercial republic, of the inviolable right of private property, of the indispensability of the market to both liberty and uh, the prosperity of the American people. But yes, we do see the capitalist class complicit in the moral and economic subversion of the American Republic through both woke capitalism, but also crony capitalism, a desire in a way to do an end run around the market through yeah. uh, the politicization of economic life. So, and I, I think when we wrote this letter, we were very careful to add those two because we we're putting together a coalition of independent minded people, none of whom are committed to or naive about socialism or Marxism, but many of whom see these problems with the, uh, not so much I would say the economic order as the, the culture that has come to replace the old bourgeois values and virtues. So it was important for us to say that, I think. Um, I think a defense simply of private property in the market against socialism would not have satisfied the majority of our signers because our moral situation today is quite complex. And I think a fulsome defense of the market and the commercial republic has to take into account these real problems. Yeah. I wanted to ask you just sort of briefly, but before we got on today, I was reading and my friend Phil Magnus pointed out, and he's been following the 1619 Project, that the New York Times, and he, he's caught them red-handed with screenshots, Yeah, that's his evidence, has surreptitiously uh, been editing the 1619 Project to take away some of the more strident claims, uh, false claims that they made at the beginning of trying to move away from saying that 1619 was the beginning of our country, uh, which was their first claim, and also moving away from uh, this idea that uh, America separated itself from Great Britain in order to bolster uh, the institution of slavery. Or an utterly absurd claim. An utterly claim. absurd claim. But they, so we've got the New York Times, the paper of record, editing its own website without telling anyone, which is a, in, to the extent that there are ethics around online journalism, if you make any substantive edits, you're supposed to draw attention to it. They did not. And then we've got the Black Lives Matter movement on their website, basically taking down their claims uh, that they wanted to abolish the nuclear family, as well as um, you know, Marxist-inspired language about business, et cetera, removing those from its website. And I thought to myself, is that in, an indication already of some good news for us, for those of us who are trying to repel this movement that they're editing themselves surreptitiously, taking off this, you know, factual errors and ideological claims that most people think are bogus, already an indication that they've overshot the mark. Well, they did overshoot because they engaged in what the political theorist Gerhard Niemeyer once called a total critique of the West and a total critique of America. And a, total critiques are always tied to totalitarianism because total critiques demand negation and destruction. So they did overshoot, and people have begun to notice. Now, I don't for a second believe Nicole Hannah-Jones and the ideologues and the participants in the grievance industry around her have changed their minds at all. It's just that they are worried that their project will be less the source of a new orthodoxy if the more egregious ideological claims remain. But look, when uh, Charles Kessler, early on during this revolution, published a piece in the New York Post called the 1619 Riot, Hannah Nicole Jones tweeted that uh, she was proud of that, you know? Yeah. In other words, she was, this is the same woman who said, when we destroy property, we're not committing violence. You know, we know the amount of yeah. property damage and the, and the violence that accompanies it. It is a form of violence, but other even more incendiary forms of violence and accompany. So, yeah, they are stepping back a bit. 
I mean, again, the trained Marxists, the ideologues who inspired and lead BLM are still yeah. trained Marxists, are still committed to the deconstruction of the family, still hate capitalism, still believe in an ideological Manichaeanism where blacks and LGBTQ people are all innocent by definition and forever, and where whites and others, I suppose Jews, are forever guilty. So nothing has changed. But I think after four months of mendacity, violence, mayhem, and the utter silence of the political class and of the Democratic Party, a good part of the country is waking up. You can see it in the declining support down from 66 to 44, I think, for BLM. People are people are now making the distinctions we made four months ago between yeah. an affirmation that all black lives matter, that all lives matter, and uh, the claims of the BLM movement. So I think we're in a better place now, even than when I wrote my culture of hate piece in July, uh, yeah. early July. Of the, I, I, I felt very alone, and I really was stunned by the palsy, the silence of the conservative political class even more so the Republican Party. Yeah. And I think people are beginning to see, and they're beginning yeah. to see in part because the ideologues push so hard, so quickly, so boldly, so nihilistically, that it's almost impossible not to see, despite the self-censorship by the mainstream media. You know, if you just watch MSNBC and... Uh, CNN, you would not know that our cities are on fire. Yeah. You simply wouldn't know. The, the mendacity there of the lying and the covering up, as many people have noted, uh, you'll have news anchors with fires raging in the background while they're reporting, uh, insisting that this is a peaceful protest or a largely peaceful protest. By the way, that I think that term, mostly peaceful protest, has become <laughs> it's ridiculous. the subject of great mockery. Yes, no, it has. You know? I think people know that mostly peaceful protests include a lot of a willful destruction. Yeah. And, uh, and and people have died. Many, many people have died. Many black people have died as a result of this. So, you know, that's a dirty little secret about BLM and, of course, Antifa. They don't care about black lives. They care about useful black lives who they can appropriate, whose deaths they can appropriate to promote a revolution, a revolutionary situation. But for the, um, the the people who are killed by black-on-black crime or by ideological thugs or this man who was just driven to suicide after being charged for defending himself against a mob, you know, they don't care about any of these lives. I think people are catching on that we're dealing with determined, radical, revolutionary nihilistic movements and not movements for justice. And that took a long time for much of the country to discover. I wanted to uh, ask, you know, a lot of people listening to us are younger academics. Uh, some, we, we have journalists, people working in Washington. Uh, some of our biggest cohorts of listeners are in you know, larger cities, New York, LA, Chicago. What do you say people concerned about this but at the same time, the feeling and the environment that they're in pretty alone in voicing it. How, how do you or, or what would be your counsel to them to at some level push against this identity politics, faith, real bad faith, uh, and, its, and its attempt to remake institutions, including institutions they may be in, where as we see, though, there's not a lot of concrete demands right now coming out of identity politics other than, um, you know, the sort of these things like defund the police. But it also, there's this, this claim, I think, as you know, within these institutions, that institutions themselves are corrupt, even though no one is actively racist inside of them. Yes, I mean, look, I don't want to go so far to say as I've given up all hope for our university, but I think the situation in the vast majority of our universities and colleges with a few notable exceptions is beyond lamentable. I think the culture of political correctness is omnipresent. I think that administrators are foolishly taking new initiatives that whose practical effect is to ratify 
and instantiate something like critical race theory as a powerful ingredient in the self-understanding of these colleges and universities. I know in my college, we, uh, uh, the president after George Floyd died decided to have a conversation with recent graduates and present students and a group of radicals highlighted my department, the Department of Political Science, which I think is the only department of the college that teaches and reflects on the civic grounds of human dignity. And yet, because we taught Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, et cetera, et cetera, and defended the American founding against Calumnist charge that it was uh, racist or that it was a republic only for white people, and we were singled out for teaching the wrong things, for not, uh, not being on board with racial and social justice, sort of vague yeah. accusation of fascism. You know, I had a student in my class I taught last semester in politics and literature. I did the Russian, Solzhenitsyn and Dostoevsky, and I was accused of not being uh, balanced in my treatment of uh, revolutionary terrorism and totalitarianism. You can't make this stuff up. Yeah. So uh, I uh, have deep sympathy for younger faculty. They're entering a world where even the freedoms and civilities and rights and prerogatives that I could appeal to are in the process of either being abolished or disregarded. So I think the project of the future has to be to do an end on existing institutions. I'm not sure yeah. mainstream journalism is reformable. I'm not sure the university is reformable. I think we have to think seriously about a new model of the university that plays by different rules, that is committed to liberal education and not ideology, that, uh, is not accredited by the existing accreditation agencies. uh, It's going to be a long-term effort, but it's got to begin now. Because otherwise, I mean, look, in 15 or 20 years, people might, like myself, in three years, won't have a place in the university. We'd never be hired, and we'd never be tolerated. I mean, the situation is just that great. So with the younger people, look, I think we have reached an existential moment where one has to decide whether or not you will live by lies, in the famous words of Solzhenitsyn, something Rod Dreher uh, writes about in his new book. doesn't mean you have to scream the truth out at every meeting or you have to make yourself a martyr. But just like in the Soviet Union, even under Brezhnev, do not sign statements you don't agree with. Do not endorse critical race theory. Do not lie about the American founding for the sake of survival. Do not pretend to be enthusiastic about thuggish ideological movements. Show some backbone. I think that's really a crucial distinction. You know, listening to someone blather on is one thing and, you know, thinking about how one opposes them. But I think that's the crucial move is do you sign things or admit to things you know are a lie in order to survive? And I think those listening have to make that decision because once you admit to that lie, you lose your witness. You lose your soul. Yeah, exactly. And you lose your self-respect, which is which is uh, part of losing yourself. Yeah, I mean, Solzhenitsyn in his great uh, manifesto, Live Not By Lies, 1974, he says, let the lie come into the world, but not through me. And he yeah. says at the end of it, he quotes Pushkin, he says, look, if we're not capable of this elemental step of not being a vehicle for the lie, then he says, we're no better than uh, sheep. We're no better than cattle or, you know, made for servitude. So, look, we're not facing full-fledged totalitarianism, although this is more than Tocqueville's soft despotism. It's harder than that. But it's going to demand civic courage. It's going to demand people who follow the arts of prudence. Do what you have to do. So you can remain a presence in the academy, but do not become a vehicle for the perpetuation of organized mendacity. Exactly. Well, Dan, thank you so much for coming on to talk to us today about liberty and justice for all, uh, available at realclearfoundation.org, where people can read uh, the statement of principles uh, that you've put forward and, and decide if they want to sign or uh, indeed send contact information to become part of, of what you guys are doing. And can I just add, if, if any listener, uh, intellectual, professor, writer, politician is interested, 
feels committed to these ideas, but has some ideas about how we can move forward in constructive civic and intellectual ways, do not hesitate to contact me at Assumption College or the other organizers because we welcome ideas and ideas for new initiatives, ideas for carrying the torch. Thank you, Dan. All right. Thanks so much, Richard. This is Richard Reinch. You've been listening to another episode of Liberty Law Talk, available at lawliberty.org.